My chance to go watch Made in China We play ping pong ball Made in China Hello and welcome to China Econ Talk. I'm Jordan Schneider, your host here today with Professor Henry Gao, uh, who is the Associate Professor of Law at Singapore Management University and also the Dongfang Scholar Chair Professor at the Shanghai Institute of Foreign Trade. He is the co-author alongside Gregory, uh, Gregory Schaffer of the recent paper, China's Rise, How It Took on the U.S. at the WTO. So as, of, as evidenced by China's recent behavior in the trade scuffles with the U.S. going on nowadays, it's clear that Chinese lawyers are far from rubes when it comes to trade. So in this interview, we'll discuss what it took for the PRC to learn to speak the language of international trade law and the implications of that knowledge both domestically and internationally. Uh, Henry, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Great to have you here. Yeah, welcome, Jordan. It's my pleasure. So, so my first question for you is a is a personal one. What what first got you interested in studying trade and trade law? Well, that was uh, I think about uh, seventeen years ago when I was a young student at uh, Vanderbilt University, doing my JD degree. Uh, I was uh, then the president of the Student International Law Society. And uh, uh, one of my tasks is to invite uh, speakers to the law school. So once I had the pleasure of inviting James Beckers, who was uh, the chairman of the WTO Petty Body and also uh, uh, the first American to be on the uh, Petty Body, the super, is a bit like the Supreme Court for the WTO. So uh, he came over and he gave a talk. The talk apparently is about the WTO international trade law and so on. So after the talk, I, I had a chat with him, and he mentioned that the WTO has this internship program, and uh, 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 one can only apply to this program if you are a citizen of a member country. So it was a, a lucky moment for me because China just joined the WTO. Then I was a Chinese citizen. So I, I was eligible to apply. So I applied to the program and I got um, in the program as an intern in the Petty Body Secretariat. And that is basically how I started to get involved in WTO issues. So what was that first experience like for you? Um, you know, clearly you must have been a, um, a person of some interest to the WTO, uh, you know, other staffers as, as you're one of the first Chinese folks to, to show up. It must have been, yes? Yes, I, I I think it was an interesting experience both for me and uh, probably for my colleagues as well because I uh, was, uh, uh, when I arrived, there was only another Chinese at the secretariat and he's not a lawyer. He's, uh, he's an economist and he used to work for the UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Uh, so I was basically the first lawyer to arrive in the WTO, and uh, a month after I arrived, there was another uh, lawyer arrived from China in the Legal Affairs Division, but uh, for a long time, there was just uh, two of us Chinese lawyers in the whole secretariat. So it was a really interesting experience. I mean, I uh, uh, learned um, a lot about how the WTO functions as an insider, uh, and uh, also I, I was able to kind of communicate uh, in a way, uh, how the Chinese review, uh, international law review, especially WTO law to my colleagues. And I think that was a great experience. So, so following that internship, you, you didn't go straight into academia. Is that correct? Uh, well, I, I uh, uh, did the internship in three months. So the internship, uh, according to WTO regulations, can last uh, uh, at most uh, three months. So I uh, finished uh, in three months. And I was really lucky because I was uh, able to complete a whole case from the beginning to the end in these uh, three months because a case typically takes three months in the uh, secretariat, uh, uh, sorry, in the appellate body. So the case I was working on was the U.S. Bird Amendment case. Uh, that was a big case. After the three months, I was transferred to the uh, Trading Service Division, which deal with the service issues. And while in the service division, uh, I was also lucky uh, that I got involved in another case, that was the Mexico Telecom case. So I worked on that case for uh, like eight months, uh, and uh, also basically from the beginning to the end. And after that, I decided that uh, uh, well, even though Geneva was uh, was a very nice city, but um, 
uh, you know, if, if I uh, stay there and uh, continue working on these cases, I basically can save my life, you know, uh, 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 from that moment. So I decided to, to change my career to uh, do something that uh, has uh, probably a bit more freedom. That is why I decided to join academia. I started in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, so my first job was in Hong Kong, first with the city of Hong Kong for one year, and then I moved to University of Hong Kong. Uh, for uh, three years, and after that, I uh, came to Singapore. Uh, so I'm now in Singapore for ten years. So um, one of the uh, one of the interesting parts about this um, this whole arc is the level of student interest, um, which which I'm sure you've had a front row seat in over the years. Uh, you you speak in your paper about a WTO craze. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the the initial excitement? That a lot of uh, Chinese policymakers um, and and, stu- and and law students as well must have had um, during that first early phase in in two thousand one when uh, when China was was joining the uh, the organization. Yeah, I I, I think uh, you know for the WTO crisis, you really have to understand it in the context of the uh, uh, of the uh, insurance system for. Um, uh, economic uh, reform in the 80s and the 90s. I mean, uh, that is, uh, in my understanding, uh, basically a continuation uh, of um, uh, the uh, insurance system for economic reform from the 80s and 90s. Uh, because people at that time, they, uh, I mean, the Chinese people and the Chinese government too, at that time, they really looked up upon the West, especially the U.S. as a kind of the model for economic reform. And uh, if you look at a lot of the reform measures during that time, it was basically uh, uh, in a way, uh, you know, uh, following the uh, uh, approach that is taking in the West, especially the U.S. So people thought that uh, joining the WTO, you know, could enable China to emulate uh, more of the U.S., and uh, that is really uh, why there was a, such uh, a craze about the WTO. So as we discussed in our paper, uh, you know, there were a lot of uh, uh, support for the WTO in the States uh, from the top of the government all the way to the uh, president, to President Jiang Zemin at that time. Actually, President uh, Jiang Zemin has organized this, uh, um, uh, this workshop uh, for the uh, governor's level. So uh, all the governors in China, he assembled them together in Beijing and uh, then uh, they invited uh, experts to give them talks on uh, the uh, basic principles of the WTO, on the rules of uh, market economy and so on. And uh, President Yang himself also served as lecturer in one of those sessions. So that was top level. And then down to the uh, uh, street level, you see that uh, all the people in China, you know, no matter whether you are a scholar or student or even a taxi driver, you know, they are all uh, uh, very happy about China joining the WTO. Actually, uh, I I think we also mentioned this in our paper. Uh, At the time of China's WTO accession, they even even had uh, competitions for taxi drivers, you know, on WTO principles. And there was also a uh, a national show uh, on WTO knowledge, and the uh, the guy who 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 won the show, who who was uh, number one nationwide, he was flown to Geneva to meet with the Director General of the WTO. So it was all like uh, you know very uh, 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 exciting in China. You know people are really excited about the WTO, and I think uh, uh, that uh, is what we would call the WTO craze. So w- what's interesting, though, is that even with with all the uh, the the popular and um, the popular enthusiasm and the enthusiasm at the um, uh, you know government and professional level, there were still a lot of core competencies uh, that the Chinese government and the Chinese government's lawyers didn't have that they needed to um, to get under their belt in order to make the most of the uh, of the membership. So could you talk about what? were the big barriers uh, at first when it came to navigating the WTO process? Yeah, well, um, you know, there was a, a lot of an insurance system, as I said, about joining the WTO, but people back then didn't really know a lot about the WTO. 
that is understandable because China didn't join the predecessor of the WTO, the GATT, for a long time. I mean, China was a founding member when the GATT was established in 1947, but then uh, um, uh, Taiwan pulled out uh, for historical reasons. So, so China was basically shut out of the GATT uh, for like uh, 40 plus years. And uh, uh, Nobody really knew, you know, the basic principles of the WTO. So uh, I think that is one barrier that is uh, the um, uh, um, lack of familiarity. We see technical knowledge in the WTO. So people didn't understand, you know, for example, what is uh, uh, most favored nation treatment, uh, what is the national treatment, uh, uh, and uh, what is non-discrimination, what is transparency, or uh, of these uh, basic WTO principles. So that is one one problem. Another problem, as we discussed in our paper, is this language barrier because the WTO has three official languages English, uh, French, and Spanish. And Chinese, even though it's the uh, official language of the United Nations, it's not an official language of the WTO. So uh, most of documents in the WTO are available in English only, and that apparently poses a barrier to, to the Chinese. And another problem is that. Uh, China traditionally is a civil law country. There are two major legal systems in the world, civil law and common law. So uh, China, uh, along with uh, um, the continental Europe countries, are mostly civil law countries. But the US, UK, Australia, Singapore, these are the uh, common law countries. So in common law countries, they, they use a lot of uh, cases, case uh, uh, law, as we uh, lawyers would call them. So in the WTO, even though strictly speaking, it's not a, a common law system because it's an international legal system, but there's a strong influence of a, a common law because the WTO has uh, adjudicated all these cases, and the decisions of the panel and the appellate body in these cases basically become layers of uh, case law in the WTO. And this is also uh, very difficult for the Chinese lawyers to understand. So all of these difficulties uh, I, I, I think um, uh, uh, was the reason why um, you know there was uh, all this barrier uh, to Chinese government, Chinese lawyers at the beginning. So what what steps did uh, did the government take to help um, to help the lawyers get on their foot? How how did this learning process begin, and what were the uh, what were some of the effective methods? Well, uh, there are many ways. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, as I said, as we mentioned in our paper, there are uh, nationwide uh, uh, campaigns to learn about the WTO, and this include top-level officials, the president, the ministers, the governors, and this also includes scholars, uh, WTO scholars in China. You know, people who used to study public international law but not shifted to WTO law, and students, and also lawyers. Uh, actually, the Chinese government realized this, so, so uh, they said uh, upon China's accession to the WTO that one of our first priorities to train a group of lawyers who understand not only law but also economics and also English. So that was the top priority. And the uh, Chinese government established all these uh, uh, WTO centers uh, around the country. So there are main centers, for example, in Beijing, in Shanghai, and in Shenzhen. And one of the main tasks of these centers is to train uh, people, uh, mostly lawyers, but also government officials, and also businessmen on WTO rules, so as to help them to understand what are the WTO rules and how they can take advantage of that. Now, uh, with regard to China's participation in WTO disputes, we also discuss uh, that is the main part of our paper. Uh, how the are working with foreign lawyers. Basically, in most cases that Chinese government get involved in, they would hire uh, both a Chinese law firm and also a foreign law firm. So uh, the Chinese lawyer would work along together with a foreign lawyer and in the process, they can learn from the foreign lawyers, uh, learn how to write, for example, legal submissions, how to advocate in court in the WTO panel and a body, and uh, how uh, to uh, defend China's position. So uh, I, I think through all of this learning process, uh, uh, we can see that the Chinese lawyers were able to uh, 
uh, develop their capacity, their ability uh, in this uh, so-called joint venture. Uh, you know, it's just like uh, the uh, Sino-Foreign uh, uh, Joint Venture uh, for other business activities, where they basically learn uh, the foreign technology, the foreign know-how, and that is how uh, uh, the Chinese lawyers got started. Yeah, I do really think that's a that's a fascinating uh, a parallel to make, uh, comparing you know the sort of OEM uh process the 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 way that china's learned how to make so much manufacturing and services um to this uh this legal knowledge so one of the interesting quotes is from your paper is how one lawyer said he loved how uh quote legal uh the wto work felt i'm curious what you think was going through his mind his or her mind when um uh, when he uh, when 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 this person said this uh, statement and what they maybe were comparing uh, their past legal work they had to do too. Right, uh, I'm really glad that you raised this point because um, actually the code in our article didn't uh, uh, you know because of a space constraint couldn't capture everything that the lawyer said. But the lawyer meant uh, you know when we were interviewing him, uh, what he really meant was that. Um, uh, when he looked at all these uh, case reports from the WQ, where the judges uh, uh, painstakingly uh, took uh, the parties' arguments and uh, analyzed them, and then uh, explained why, for example, he agreed with one party but not the other party, or he disagreed with uh, either party, and um, then went into very detailed analysis of not only the arguments, but also the words used by the parties. So you see that there's a really a refined analysis of the meaning of specific wordings. For example, in WTO agreements, where the um, uh, judges in the WTO would refer to, for example, the dictionary, the shorter of uh, the shorter Oxford dictionary on uh, English, um, and uh, uh, the other dictionaries, and uh, discuss in detail what has a specific meaning for uh, particular words. And that is an eye-opener for that lawyer because, uh, I mean, even though he, he also practiced before Chinese courts, uh, before that, uh, but uh, the way that the Chinese courts uh, render its judgments is very different. Um, I, I think this has to do with the difference between the common law and the civil law system too. Basically, in civil law countries, you see that the judges just cite to specific uh, uh, provisions in the law, in the uh, legislation, and they say because of uh, Article so and so of this uh, so and so law, therefore we rule for the uh, defendant or the plaintiff and so on. So there was not really a lot of uh, analysis, a lot of discussion. Uh, and what really struck this lawyer is the level of a sophistication uh, of detail in the analysis. Uh, in the judgments uh, from the WTO, and he really loved it because this showed you how the judges uh, were thinking about this issue, how they w went about analyzing the issue, and uh, this really helped you to understand the meaning uh, of the agreements. And I think that is uh, what he mean by uh, how legal the WTO work was. So this um, this uh, experience that this lawyer had of coming to respect more and more the um, uh, the decisions and the impartial impartiality of the WTO is something that also uh, is is a process that also happened throughout the um, the broader uh, you know Chinese system from government agencies to businesses as well. Um, so one of the one of the uh, sentences you say is how Mofcom. Um, brought huge delegations to Geneva because it because it wanted to show other agencies that the process was fair um, and that if China going is going to lose, it would have to make um, it, and that when China was going to lose, it wanted these uh, businesses to understand that uh, the the justification and how to um, bring rule of law and make compliance easier. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about how um, you know maybe some initial frustrations of of China getting ruled against and people not really understanding uh, what was going through the WTO appellate court's mind uh, ended up uh, winning, ended up eventually winning people over to the idea of um, WTO. Right. I mean, um, what you mentioned, you know, as we discussed in our article, the fact that that's 
brought these uh, big delegations that compose of not only the officials from MOFCOM, but also the officials from the other ministries that are involved in the uh, uh, drafting process for the uh, legislation at issue, and even uh, members of the firm. That is very important because when uh, uh, you know all these disputes were first brought against China in the WTO, the uh, Chinese government didn't take it well because the Chinese government thought that uh, you know if you sue me in the WTO, that is an uh, act of a host uh, hostility. So the, the the Chinese government basically took a kind of hostile approach to this because they thought that uh, if we are friends, you shouldn't uh, you know uh, start suing me in the WTO. But then gradually they realized that um, uh, that is not necessarily the case. I mean, uh, being involved in a litigation doesn't mean that uh, uh, you are at the end of the diplomatic relationship. Because if you look at the other WTO members, US and EU, for example, they are among the best friends among all WTO members. But they are suing each other all the time. Uh, it's like more than half of the disputes involve you know, them suing each other, basically. So uh, China started to understand this, uh, and especially MOFCOM, they started to understand this because they are the ones who have to deal with WTO issues on a daily basis. But the people in the other ministries, they uh, uh, still lack understanding. For example, people in the Ministry of, uh, uh, let's say, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Ministry of uh, Telecommunication, Ministry of uh, uh, Industry, um, and the Ministry of... Uh, 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 publications and uh, uh, even this uh, uh, all-powerful NDRC. Uh, so they didn't understand. So what MOFCOM did was that uh, you know by taking them to Geneva, MOFCOM basically, uh, in addition to litigate and uh, defend China's interests, but also MOFCOM was um, you know educating these uh, other ministries. But telling them, look, this is how things work in the WTO. You know, if you are saying that uh, I didn't do anything wrong, it's not uh, uh, enough that you just uh, say that. You have to prove that. You have to provide evidence that show them that you didn't violate, uh, you know, text of the WTO law. You have to show them, look, this is how I understand what a particular uh, term or a particular word in the WTO agreement means and try to persuade the WTO panel at the body in the agreement with you. So uh, they started to see this, and the, they started to see that the WTO litigation is not really a hostile act. Instead, it is a way for them to help themselves too, by, by help them to clarify, for example, what is the true rationale for enacting this legislation. Uh, uh, and how this legislation could be better uh, drafted uh, so as to minimize this impact on trade, on international uh, flow of trade. So that, I think, is the uh, probably the most valuable lesson, uh, the takeaway from all these WTO litigations. And MOFCOM acted as a, uh, basically a kind of a anchor uh, in China uh, between the WTO and the other ministries and uh, help to channel all these uh, uh, rule-abiding uh, spirit to the other ministries in China. So, uh, you know, as we as we move in our in our timeline to the uh, to the mid and late 2000s, China starts to feel more confidence with this system and, and starts to bring more and more cases of its own. Um, can you talk about that that evolution? Yeah, uh, well, uh, that is something I observed, and uh, I've written a couple of articles on that. Uh, I mean, if you look at uh, uh, the um, basically the process of Chinese participation in WTO disputes, you can observe uh, uh, three distinct uh, stages. Where uh, initially, that is uh, basically up until around 2006, China was very reluctant. So basically, the first five years, China was reluctant to getting involved in disputes whenever a dispute was brought against China. China basically says, yes, you are right, and then settle the case without getting involved in the full litigation because China was afraid to litigate. But from 2006, China started to change its attitude and start to 
participate more actively by not only defending itself to the full length of the WTO delegation from consultation to panel to appellate body, but also bringing more cases against the other countries. Uh, the, the, the turning point, I think, is because China realized around 2005, 2006 that it is normal to have a WTO disputes. And it is normal to be sued. It is normal to sue other countries. Uh, that is uh, why you know China adopted a different approach because they realized that they couldn't just uh, hide behind all this uh, settlement all the time. They have to do something. So they started to be uh, more active in the disputes, uh, and that is uh, what I would call you know a rule a shaker stage where they uh, shake the WTO rules to try to gain some advantage. And then from 2008 onwards, you see that China intermediate rule take a stage. That is the stage where China tried to uh, uh, adopt, a, uh, uh, adopt a, uh, novel interpretations of uh, key WTO disciplines or rules in a way that is more beneficial to its own interests. For example, you see this uh, with regard to its interpretation on uh, uh, certain uh, regulations governing subsidies, on certain rules governing the use of anti-dumping uh, anti dumping measures, uh, and so on. So that is where you see China started to, uh, uh, you know, really use the rules to its own interests, and that is why I would call it a rule, a rule uh, maker uh, stage. So those are the three stages, and uh, uh, from the evolution of the three stages, you can really see that uh, China was uh, uh, adapting uh, China's um, uh, uh, attitude towards WTO disputes was evolving. It was uh, uh, it was uh, different than when it was uh, uh, when it first acceded to the WTO. So that shows that China became more competent in using WTO rules. So. That is another thing that we discuss in our paper, whereby you see that China started out as a kind of a student learning from the master like the U.S., but then as China gradually uh, mastered the, 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 the rules of the game, China started to use these rules to its own interests, so the student became the master in a way. So what, what's interesting Comparing how China really has taken to the WTO and this uh, this realm of international uh, legal um, dispute is how, for you know, uh, territorial issues and and things like laws of the sea, uh, China's still uh, doesn't necessarily have. Uh, there's no love lost between uh, between China and and other international dispute rec uh, uh, reconciliation systems. So, could you explain the tension there um, and why uh, what why the why the difference in um, in perspectives on 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 these sorts of things? Well, uh, for territorial disputes, uh, China is taking a different approach, as you mentioned, uh, but. Uh, that is related to the different perspective China is having on territorial uh, uh, versus uh, economic disputes. Now, um, the Chinese government has in the past defined what it calls is a core interest. If you look at the list of the core interests, one of the core interests would be national sovereignty and a territorial integrity of China. So that means that on these issues, because it relates to China's core interests, therefore, there's no way for China to bargain, okay, or to be subject itself to another uh, international uh, institution, be it a adjudicative body like the uh, 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 United Nations uh, International Court of Justice or another political body like the United Nations. So on, on, on these type of issues, China would not want to be subject to uh, 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 a third party. But on economic disputes, because economic disputes is not among the core interests, so China is able to take a more flexible approach by subjecting itself to the system, because China uh, realized that, uh, well, uh, these are not core interests, and also deep down, you know, if you look at China's um, uh, interest in the long term, actually 
it uh, is beneficial to China to uphold the rule-based international trading system like the WTO. So it's important to think about the um, the kind of broader context and and the arc from going, uh, you know, from Mao uh, to this uh, to this time where there are, are Chinese lawyers in suits arguing in front of um, appellate courts at the WTO. One of your uh, interviewees uh, said, uh, "I am a person who lived in the time of the Cultural Revolution. I was in China from the worst time, and now." Uh, I can say it's not easy progress for China to become what it is today. We went through a lot of ups and downs and suffered a lot. But now I see the people, news, criticism, comments, journalists. It's unbelievable. Um, from your perspective, it might be normal. But for me, it's really unbelievable. Now we can criticize the government, comment on the policies, talk about the WTO. It's really changed a lot. Um, so my two questions for you in regards to this interview is, do you recall when um, uh, when he made those comments? And... Um, uh, and, and what do you think it means for China as a country um, that on the one side is really engaging um, with this WTO uh, international arbitration, but at the same time, we have Xi Jinping um, consolidating power, um, uh, apparently going to stay in um, uh, cracking down on dissent and apparently going to stay in um, in, in, in in the leadership indefinitely. So this guy. I mean, his uh, assessment has to, has to be looked at in a longer time frame. Uh, he uh, went through the Cultural Revolution, so he apparently saw the days that China was uh, uh, in uh, much worse shape than it is today. So that is why you know he welcomed this uh, uh, more liberal approach towards uh, freedom of expression, you know, uh, towards international rule of law, uh, and so on. So, so I, I, I think if you look at it from that perspective, uh, he is right. But uh, as you said, if you compare the situation five years ago, or maybe a longer time uh, frame from the 90s or the 80s to today, then uh, you might um, be disappointed. So another thing that uh, was expressed in the end of your paper was this growing cynicism when it comes to WTO law uh, and how it's perceived as, as less important than it was maybe uh, five or ten years ago. Can you talk about the factors going into that and the potential implications that it has for, uh, for Chinese policy? Well, uh, there is a whole of reasons for this. I mean, um, on the one hand, you saw that the WTO uh, the current uh, negotiation round, the Doha round, went into uh, basically uh, 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 problems um, for a long time, and uh, then it became uh, stalled uh, about 10 years ago, since 2008. So a lot of people are saying that the WTO is dead. I I, I, I don't agree that the WTO is dead. I, I think the WTO has slowed down, but it's definitely not dead yet. But that apparently, you know, um, uh, weakened the uh, um, uh, attraction of the WTO uh, uh, to some extent in China. And another reason is because uh, there's a shifting of negotiations from the WTO to all these uh, regional trade agreements, or free trade agreements, including the TPP and what China is doing itself, the uh, RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. So... Um, that also uh, reduced the importance of the WTO. And uh, a third reason is because uh, this increasing rise of uh, uh, protectionism uh, worldwide, where you see, especially in the U.S. recently, you know, with Trump came into the White House. So you, you, you saw uh, that the U.S. started to act uh, more and more protectionist by using all these uh, uh, tools uh, for trade protection, even though uh, WTO has uh, explicitly ruled that uh, they are illegal, for example, Section 301, the WTO had a case before, and according to this uh, decision of the WTO, it could not be used unilaterally by the U.S., but the U.S. Is still use it. So all of these factors combined together started to cast some doubt on the uh, effectiveness of the WTO as uh, an international institution. And I think that explains uh, uh, why there was this uh, uh, cynicism towards the WTO nowadays uh, in China. Uh, and that combine, combined with the in, uh, increasing turn to, to, to um, you know, more 
uh, to the uh, left by the Chinese government in a way by strengthening, for example, the role of the party, the role of the state-owned enterprises in the economy, uh, can can indeed give rise to, to some uh, you know worries about how uh, this is going to play out in China. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, in the long run, uh, I mean, uh, I am rating another shorter piece uh, discussing uh, what the what are the implications of the actions of the U.S. and the EU on China. Um, for example, uh, about a year ago, when uh, this provision on the non-market economy status of China uh, that was contained in China's accession protocol expired, the U.S. and the EU refused to grant market economy to China, even though according to the WTO agreement, it was very clear after this uh, um, a 15 year period that ended in December 2016, they could no longer treat China as a non market economy, but they refused to do that. So I, I, I think this is going to backfire because China will learn these lessons and China will uh, uh, learn the lesson from the US EU that they could man manipulate the WTO rules just for their short term interest. And then China might emulate them, might learn from their examples and do the same. And if, this, if that happens, then that is bad news for everyone in the whole world. Do you have any um, any further thoughts on the uh, on the implications of uh, of this recent uh, the uh, threats and tit for tat uh, between the U.S. and China uh, throwing tariffs that that certainly are are not WTO compliant? Yeah, yeah, I, I I'm sorry that we have to end this with a rather unpleasant note, but. Uh, you know, this is the time we are in. I mean, uh, if you look at the actions on both sides, um, of course, the U.S., uh, you know, have to bear probably a larger share of the blame because it's the U.S. which first started this. But on the other hand, if you look uh, deeper into the U.S. complaint, I mean, uh, you couldn't say that the U.S. did this for no reason because part of the U.S. complaint is that uh, when China uh, uh, joined the WTO, China agreed to move towards more of the market economy side of things. But uh, if you look at what happened in the past five years, I mean, there has been a retract uh, towards more like uh, uh, state-owned uh, uh, economy uh, or uh, the government-owned economy in China rather than market economy side. So uh, I think the U.S. concern uh, is legit in a way. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the reactions from China, I mean, China retaliated with only, uh, its own list of uh, 50 billion uh, uh, items. Uh, and uh, the uh, Chinese government is uh, saying that uh, all these are WTO consistent, but I, I doubt this too. I mean, just as the initial uh, 50 billion list of the U.S. is inconsistent with the WTO rules, the uh, new retaliation list by the Chinese government is also not consistent with the WTO rules. Either it violated a host of uh, WTO provisions just like the U.S., so if we continue doing this, I mean, everyone breaking the rules, uh, then then we 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 will not have the best of the uh, of the world for for anyone. So I I hope that uh, somebody somebody in both governments can come back to their senses and uh, realize that uh, uh, this is not good for anyone, and stop this, and then. Uh, maybe we we could start to have more hope in the international rule of law. Yeah, I think what's what's really important to um, to emphasize, which you hinted at, is the uh, the importance of norms to this uh, WTO system and and the kind of belief in uh, the norms and the practice is what ends up leading to compliance. Um, you know, a WTO uh, appellate uh, proceeding takes a really long time. Countermeasures may not. Um, come into effect into years and years later. So it's really, um, you know, the, the magic of the WTO is really the the country's buy in, right? And once you lose that, um, then a lot of the a lot of the force uh, that that these ruling has starts to um, uh, starts to fade away. Yes, I fully agree. So um, on that note, I think we'll I think we'll call it a day. Henry, thanks so much for taking the time hoping to uh, have you back on the show sometime soon. Sure, you are welcome, Jordan. Good luck on the show.